I'm Ramona Koval from ABC Radio National's book show. And uh, here at the Sydney Writers' Festival, it's uh, marvellous to see you all. And I have great pleasure to be speaking with a man who really is a global public intellectual. John Ralston Saul cares about a lot of things and he cares about communicating them to people all over the world and writing about them. His books, including novels, have been translated into 22 languages in 30 countries. As an essayist and writer of highly influential books like The Doubter's Companion, Voltaire's Bastards, On Equilibrium and The Unconscious Civilization, John Ralston Saul focused our attention on the way that reason and thinking and measuring things has been used and misused to run inflexible management doctrines and economic ideologies that are anti-democratic. And in his updated book, The Collapse of Globalism and the Reinvention of the World, he follows this up with a critique of their massive failures and after the events of 2008, which we now describe as the global financial crisis, he can say, I told you so, which so many people, especially those in politics and banking, clearly can't. Please welcome John Ralston Saul to Australia and to Sydney. Well, John, when we last spoke, it was Montreal. Yes, it, it was. was. Blue Metropolis. Blue Metropolis. It was 2003. We were speaking about this time since 1973 when we entered into this idea that uh, there was an inevitability of globalisation, there was nothing you could <clears> do <throat> about it, and then you said from 1998 that globalisation began to die. Uh, you were confident that the ideas uh, that we were just one big market and whatever happened to exchanges between people uh, was the same that when, it, when you blew it up and writ, writ the whole thing large w was, um, was all the same all over the world. Um, well, uh, they were losing power, you said at the time, in 2003. In 2005, uh, The Collapse of Globalism and the Reinvention of the World was published and you warned that, like it or not, globalism was collapsing and if we didn't act quickly, we would be caught in a crisis and limited to emergency reactions. So how would you describe the world we find ourselves in today? You just described it. <laughs> I mean, it's... You know, one of the difficulties is that when you... you first of all... As soon as you hear elites of any sort, writers, politicians, business people, bureaucrats, economists, whatever, saying that we're in a situation where everything's inevitable, you know we're in deep trouble. Uh, you know, they're, they're, it, it, this is a, a rewriting of an old cliche. There are only two inevitable things, and those are you know, death and sex. Um, not taxes. It's a very, very badly thought out idea because there are lots of people who don't pay taxes who have a lot of money. Uh, so it, 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 it is not inevitable. Economic systems do not last a long time. There is no such thing as an economic system which is an inevitability which will be there forever. History does not end. Uh, you know, some guy who's a tenured professor announces that history ends and everyone buys the book. I'm standing around saying, this guy ought to be thrown out of the university. I mean, he's intellectually incompetent because he doesn't know anything about history. It doesn't end. And he's still there. And they're still hiring him to give opinions on what's happening. Anyway, uh, uh, what can I say? I don't know how to harm him. Because uh, <laughs> he harms himself and will be looked upon, of course, as one of the jokes of the late 20th century and the early 21st century. Uh, he'll be looked back on as one of the figures of uh, fools of the time, if you like. Uh, but how does it feel to be able to say, I told you so? Oh, really good. Um, <clears throat> Not that you want other people to suffer, but you know, coming out of a, relative, out of a kind of Anglican Protestant background, uh, when I re rewrote the, put a, put a conclusion on the book, because it really didn't have a proper conclusion, and I felt really good about it, that finally I was able to say exactly, there, there I told you what was going to happen, and here it's happened, and all my family, my friends all said, for God's sake, John, don't ever say I told you so. It's so looked down upon in the Judeo-Christian tradition. And, uh, and I said, well, on the other hand, you know, it's kind of fun. And, um, but the, the tragedy is that, the, the real tragedy is that 
first of all, the ideas at the basis of globalism. I'm not saying everything wasn't wrong with globalism. There's lots of good things. I mean, protectionism isn't, isn't a blanket answer to anything. Free trade isn't a blanket answer to anything. I mean, none of these are blanket answers. Uh, uh, but some good stuff came out of globalism. It was a way to turn around a corner, of, which was very difficult in the 19, early 1970s. But the fact of the matter is that you could see that it wasn't going to work out. You could see, you know, the middle class is getting squeezed. You could see rich-poor divides. You could see that, that we were producing more goods than we needed while we were still calling for more growth. Why well, call for more growth when you're in surplus? What does that mean? You know, you, so that it was obvious that it was going to end relatively badly. It was pretty obvious to me after 95 and the creation of the WTO that after that moment, nothing big and positive happened for the globalist movement. And instead of that, this rather ramshackle bus, globalism, uh, going down an increasingly, I'm trying to use a really bad cliche here, but going down a kind of increasingly rocky road and then, you know, the, the mirrors fell off and one of the tires came off and the windows started breaking and then they couldn't get into fourth gear and then et cetera, et cetera. And the thing just started falling apart, you know, the meltdown in Asia uh, and, and so on and so on. So that by, you know, by 2001, it was clear that it was over. But, of course, you've got an elite who are entirely trained to run this inevitable system for the rest of time. So they have absolutely no idea how to do anything else. They just say, oh, you're against globalism. I say, no, I'm not. I'm not for it or against it. But the point is what you're doing doesn't work. That's the point. It's not an attack on, 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 on God. You think this is God. You know, it isn't God. It's just an economic theory. That's all it is. It's not a big deal. You know, don't get so overexcited about it. Just say, look, you tried this economic theory out. It's had a couple of decades. Some of it's worked. Most of it hasn't worked. And now we have to do something else. But instead of that, we waited and waited. I said by about 2000, we'd gone into a, a, a vacuum, which is what you go into at the end of a system before you go into the next system. And when you're in this vacuum, this, uh, vacuum is the wrong word, but you're in this period, there's no man's land or no woman's land. And it's an era of disorder. And it's that moment when interesting people say, okay, where do we go next? Instead of that, what everybody said was, no, everything's okay. We were reassured. That's that, that managerial thing, reassure them, keep them calm, otherwise the peasants will run amok. And, you know, they were so frightened that you'd run amok that they calmed you down. And the result is we just sat around until the crisis hit us. And, and now you're all in debt. You spent 30 to 40 years making sacrifices to get out of debt, and now they've massively indebted you again. For what purpose? But the real question for us is who can we blame? <coughs> really? Um, could, could we blame the Americans? But then we had to blame the Scottish <coughs> banks. Right. Suddenly the Scottish banks, who would have thought? And then the Icelanders. We had no idea it was the Icelanders' fault. I don't think you need to blame. I think the people you need to blame are... Um, uh, if I were going to make a list of blame, which is sort of pointless, but... It, it, but fun on a Saturday. But fun. Uh, no, it has some utility actually. The, the, the first group I would blame would be the departments of economics, because that's where the ideas come from. That in the universities. In the universities. I mean, that sounds so boring. You'd rather that I blame somebody you knew the name of and could identify that you could go out and spit on or something. But, but the fact is that these ideas which lie at the base of what governments and private sector people will do come out of those departments of economics. And they carried out between the 70s and in the 70s, 80s, 90s, a kind of intellectual cleansing of alternate thought so that they became places where 95% of the economists thought the same thing. At this very moment, they are teaching your children, or if your children, you, um, exactly the same ideas they were teaching 10 years ago, which are precisely the ideas which have brought the crisis. They haven't changed a thing. Why would they change it? They're the custodians of truth, right? So that inflexibility and incapacity to engage in debate and to treat economics as a place of discussion rather than a place of truth where you eliminate people who disagree with you. That is really a problem, because if you're a prime minister and you say, well, what else could we do? You turn to the economists, and they're all saying the same thing. Even on the left or the right, they're all saying the same thing. Number two, I think you can blame the business schools, because the business schools are the kind of unthinking, utilitarian application of the departments of economics. So they just sort of roll on. And, of course, they believe in common control. That's what business schools believe in. So they, in a way, again, eliminate the possibility of discussion. Of course, they're not about risk. They're not about the public good. They're not about ownership. They're about management. 
So they, in a way, have created this enormous block of false stability, which makes it hard to see that action is required. Then I'd blame the, the consultancy industry, which, of course, is a child of the departments of economics and the business schools. Um, and then after that, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Who would you blame? Well, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> but what... The bank. Well, but the banks, you see, are an outcome, <clears throat> to the extent that they're part of the problem, they're an outcome of the first three. Well, the, the, let me, we'll get to that in a second. But, I mean, the Federal Reserves, I think you have to kind of look at one by one. I think most, my exp impression was, in the late 90s, uh, was that most of the Federal Reserves were pretty good. I mean, yours was saying constantly off the record, which is what they were supposed to do at that time, uh, they were saying constantly to the politicians and to the, in, um, um, the, the World Bank and so on, they were saying, look, this is a catastrophe. This is not going to work. I mean, I spoke to the head of your, your uh, reserve bank, and he was saying in 99, he was saying, you know, as best he could, he was warning that this would lead to catastrophe. And almost every one of them, except the British and the Americans, were saying that. But, of course, they were still under that old thing that reserve bankers are not supposed to make a lot of noise in public. So they were making a lot of noise in semi-public, semi-private, i.e. to the leaders who are elected and are supposed to do these things. And they were ignored. Could, can you just hang on a second? We'll have questions later. This is great. This is, for those of you who can't hear because it isn't mic'd, we've got a very participating audience, which is yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Except which I, is just, great. I just want to get through a few things, and then I'm going to call for questions. But, but there's do, no question that Greenspan and his equivalent in England were catastrophic because they had totally and utterly bought into the idea of, you know, the invisible hand and the natural balances in the marketplace. And above all, they'd bought into this idea that they couldn't explain it because, frankly, they weren't sufficiently intellectual to be able to understand. They weren't very bright. I mean, you know, one of the great revelations is, you know, Greenspan was a very mediocre figure. After all, he thought that Ayn Rand was a great novelist. Yeah, that's right. So that tells you everything about the fact that he wasn't a very bright guy. But how do you view the emergency responses? Well, you know, it, there's a yes and a no. I mean, they did the right thing in the sense that they wanted to prevent uh, a collapse which would hurt people. But then they got confused about what it was they were protecting. Because having prevented the immediate collapse, there was a real need, I think, to sit down and say, OK, what is it that needs to be saved? And what is it that we need to junk? You know, junk bonds, you know, right? junk it, throw it away. And they, they really <clears throat> missed an enormous opportunity, which was to clear the tables. The best way out of a financial crisis <clears throat> is to actually rip up as much of the debt as you can. The worst thing you can do is to use whoever's money, in this case your money, they printed it on your backs, to use you in order to prop up stuff which isn't real. And so it brings you back to this delusionary activity that, that people like Greenspan were at the heart of, which is believing that, that money is real. Money isn't real. Money is an illusion. Money is so, an imaginary so, thing. And, you, and it's a game where you have to say, how much money do we need to make everything work? And you don't need more than that. Now, it's not a fine science. But you don't go from, I don't remember the numbers, but you don't go from a multiple of you know, 10 times more money than goods traded to a multiple of whatever it is today, 70 or 80 times, without anybody saying, well, what does this mean? Well, people were saying, well, you don't understand. It's so sophisticated today because of technology. As soon as people say because of technology, you know they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> because technology is just a mechanism. It's great, but it's, a mecha it's not a purpose. It's a mechanism. So as soon as they said because of technology, money has become real, you knew they were talking nonsense because it was really the kind of sentence you'd have heard during the South Sea bubble days or, or something like that. So are you talking about using the money that they raise on our backs to support the banks, for example, that are too big to fail. This question yeah, but you see, it's not really about supporting the banks that are too big to fail, because what are the banks in this case? It's really what is it precisely that they were holding up? See, that's what they didn't do. By saying the banks, you, they didn't ask the precise question, which is, what is it exactly? I mean, if we're talking about people's houses and mortgages, that's a completely separate issue from kinds of money which might have been produced by hostile takeovers, which were all about creating artificial debt. I mean, it's almost as if what you needed to do was the, you know, to have a, a, re a revolutionary tribunal of the old sort, in which you took some really interesting people, 
uh, I'm, I'm, I could make up some lists for you, and you put them at a table, and then people come and say, you know, here is the trillion dollars worth of debt, which we, which we will either save or junk. And then you sit there and you say, you make piles. I mean, you have to, you take this out of mysticism, right? Make piles and say, okay, mortgages, we'll put the mortgages, that's got to be helped. Um, uh, uh, retirement savings plans, that's got to be looked after. And then you have all these other piles, which are the junk piles. And I think if you'd done that, you'd have discovered that, you know, nobody knows, but somewhere around 50 to 80 percent of what was saved was junk. So once you've established that it's junk, and you say, well, that's a little complicated, because although it's junk, it's related to those pension funds. You say, okay, so how much do we need to deal with the pension? How do we carve off the way a, a doctor would? How much do we carve off the junk in order to save the pension fund? 10 percent. Okay, done. Okay, now it's junk. So we have these big piles of junk, which are not real money. And what would have happened if you'd have said, okay, no. junk off the table? So here's what you do. It's really, it's, this is, you have to be very sophisticated. You make lovely envelopes, you know, psychological envelopes. You put the junk paper in the envelopes and you write on the envelopes things like incredibly important pieces of paper. And you seal them up and you put them in a drawer and say, open in 200 years. <laughs> and they're gone. And what would They're have gone. happened to the people who are in those and, industries and working in that area? Well, they'd have woken up in the morning and got down to work on doing something new. What's the problem? I mean, what, 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 is, what is virtuous about spending one's life trying to pretend that something which has failed has not failed? And it had no use in the first place. I mean, why should the people of Australia or Canada or England or France have their child's future limited in any way, shape, or form by, by money which, isn't even, which has no utility? I mean, you see, this is being trapped inside a logic. I mean, oh, you don't understand. This is so complicated. It's not complicated. It's only complicated because they want it to be complicated because they're locked inside these silos. It's actually quite simple. I mean, the history of money is really pretty straightforward. And the fact that there's technology and, and, and larger amounts has not changed the basics of how money functions. And so but the problem is you end up with people like Alan Greenspan who aren't terribly bright. And they got to keep saying that. You've got to get used to saying things like that. Because, you see, once you realize that he wasn't terribly bright, it frees you. You are free to think that his decisions weren't terribly bright. So why would you risk your healthcare system to defend the reputation of a guy who wasn't very bright and was wrong. Better to junk him and the memory of him. So if we, if we retreat am I, from Am I being sensible enough? I hope I am. I mean, for a Saturday morning, but... If, if we retreat from globalism... No, I didn't say that. Go on. <laughs> I didn't... If, because, that, you see, retreating from globalism... You have, you have to redo the phrase. If... if I'm not suggesting a retreat into old-fashioned nationalism. I'm not suggesting putting up barriers. I'm saying that globalism is a theory. In the world of, in, in, in the broad spectrum of international theories, there are many of them. Globalism is one among many. So all I'm saying is, you know, the globalist approach towards international, internationalism hasn't worked out. Let's use some other theories of internationalism which are more interesting. Like what? Well, uh, you know, you could have, uh, instead of, th the basis of globalism was uh, that you would look at everything through an economic prism. A very unusual idea. It's never been done before in history at the international level. There are almost no countries ever tried to see itself through an economic prism. So let's just drop that because we know it doesn't work. Economics is important, but it's not a primary way of looking at society, make it a secondary or tertiary way of looking at society. So there's all sorts of other forms of internationalism which might have to do with a different relationship to geography, which might have to do with a different relationship, a belief in systems uh, based on citizens, um, a belief that, uh, uh, you know, that, that capitalism, while essential, uh, has perhaps reached one of those moments when it needs to be seriously rethought. Why? Well, because the, the, the central, you know, people always talk about, you know, capitalism, the market, competition, uh, efficiency, you know, there's a list, right? And all, that's a list that was put together in the 1780s, early 19th century in northern England and Scotland. There's nothing global about it. It's a couple of hundred years old and it came from a particular place inside a particular country. You know, it isn't from God. It's something that worked pretty well when they invented various kinds of production. That's all it is. And so, you, if you actually look at the list, you discover that the one thing that's never mentioned 
is scarcity. That the, the basis of capitalism is that competition, growth, continued increased production all work because there's a scarcity. We don't have enough bracelets, uh, nice mauve shirts, uh, lovely dresses, uh, great earrings. We don't have enough, so we have to have a competition to produce more, and people make money and can, can charge enough because there's a scarcity. As soon as you've got too many apples, the price of apples falls. That's a surplus, right? right? The West... I shouldn't say that. I always say the West, and then, it's, and then I have to say including Australia. Um, the developed economies, the developed capitalist social democratic economies, because it's that kind of basis that we develop, uh, are all in surplus. We're in surplus on every single thing. I mean, there'll be some breakthroughs in medicine where we're not yet in surplus or whatever, but we're basically in surplus. As a result of being in surplus, the value of all the goods starts dropping because there is no possibility of real competition, Right? And so the more you produce, the more the prices will drop, which means the less likely it is that Australians can produce them because middle-class people can't be paid enough to produce goods whose prices are dropping all the time because you're in surplus. And that's why you end up, say, going to China or whatever, because the Chinese can offer you goods that are cheap enough uh, that you can afford to buy them as the prices drop. The only piece missing is, of course, who's going who's to earn money to buy them and how are they going to earn that money. But that kind of contradiction is the contradiction you get when you stay inside a 200-year-old system without asking yourself, what has changed? See, if you're in surplus, then you have to change radically the way in which you handle the marketplace. Which doesn't mean you go over to old-fashioned socialism or communism. It means that you, you, you do things that you think, well, instead of producing more and more apples in a more and more industrial way for less and less, what we actually ought to do is produce fewer apples. How can we produce fewer apples? Well, let's produce apples of higher and higher quality. We replace scarcity with quality, value added. So as soon as you add on the quality issue, the, the price goes up because the quantity goes down. You see? And then suddenly, you're, you're, the, the, suddenly the whole definition is no longer about growth. It's about quality. And suddenly sophisticated economies like yours are back in the game. I, I asked the question about globalism. So that was a long answer, I apologize. That was a long answer, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but uh, because I'm interested in your interest in nationalism too, because um, you, you have been writing for years and, and, and uh, being an a activist inside Canada and writing about what it means to be Canadian. And, uh, this is, and you know, looking at great uh, Canadians and the series of, of great Canadians. So there is something about nationalism that appeals to you, that you think is important. Well, I mean, I said, I said this in, in, in Collapse of Globalism as well. Uh, the error in the post-war period, the post-Second World War period, was increasing this idea that, uh, that internationalism would mean a constant borderless world in which everything just moved around. Um, so how many of you have lived more than 50% of your time outside of Australia? Uh, that's pretty good. About a dozen out of, what is this, 400 people or something? Um, uh, that's the reality of the world. And this is, this is you know, in a place like this, you've got a book-reading audience, so it's, it tends to be a middle-class audience. So the international average would be about 3%. You know, if you don't include, of course, the new Australians, right? But once you include them, that number would go up, uh, quite rightly. So to announce that the world is borderless and people come from nowhere and they move around actually is a lie. They actually do come from somewhere. And if you look at an issue like, it, you see, you have to rethink the whole nationalist idea. That's why I talk about negative nationalism versus positive nationalism. You say, okay, the world's borderless. Uh, everybody goes all over the place. Okay, how do we do democracy? Democracy is about engaged citizenship. You can't be engaged as a citizen nowhere. You can't be engaged as a citizen everywhere. It's about the quality of the schools. It's about whether there are enough swimming, whether the life-saving clubs are working around on, on the coasts of Australia. It's whether the food, the water is poisonous or not. I mean, you have to engage in that in your town, in your state, in your country. That's how societies function. So that doesn't stop you from being international. But if you're not attached to where you are, then who is running that? Oh, well, we're going to let the bureaucrats run that? You're going to let the corporations run that? Who say they're from nowhere? So you have to be from somewhere. Literature is always about the local. 
The great novels, the great universal, international, timeless novels are usually about something that happens to a small group of people in a small place. That's because the reality lies in that place. So belonging is essential, but belonging is not about race. It's not about ex exclusion. It's not about being better than other people. All that awful 19th century you know, nationalism which brought two world wars and million, 100 million people killed in Europe in less than half a century. I mean, belonging can be about responsibility. It can be about engagement. If we understood the nature of belonging properly, we would have solved a lot of the environmental problems we've got. It's because so many people can believe they come from nowhere or they don't have the language about belonging, which is positive language as opposed to negative language. Do you, uh, do you think we should be proud of being who we are? Like, are you proud to be a Canadian? Well, I mean, I think, you see, that what one has to do is watch carefully the language in this sense that there is so much language which was used, particularly from about 1850 to 1950, where as soon as you said you were proud to be Australian, it had, a, a, it, again, a list. And what did that actually mean? It might have meant exclusion. It might have meant white Australia. It might have meant, uh, you know, a whole list of not particularly pleasant things. So, I mean, somebody who isn't proud of where they're from has got a serious problem. You know, but being proud of where you're from doesn't mean exclusion or race or whatever. It may mean inclusion. And I think that, you know, it's one of the reasons I'm increasingly trying to talk about the fact that the moment has come for us to say that concepts of nationalism, concepts of the nation state, concepts of efficiency and so on, which led to globalism and also led to world wars, also led to the uh, uh, murder of millions and millions of people in death camps. All those concepts come out of a European tradition of philosophy, which came out of the Enlightenment and rationality. And, you know, I've written a lot about this. And, and uh, I've tried to struggle with how do you keep elements like rationality without being victims of them? So that's why I wrote books like On Equilibrium. You balance them against other qualities. But I must admit that as time goes by, I'm, I'm more and more interested for a country like Australia or a country like Canada and other countries in the fact that we have within our countries other philosophical traditions, other cultural traditions which are not European, in particular the indigenous. And the tendency is, of course, to immediately go into all the problems which we know exist and we know why they exist and we know all the wrong that was done. And, and that, that's a separate question. I'm not addressing that question. The, the fascinating thing today is that, that actually indigenous peoples have an unbroken ability, I and mean, what's the right way to say this, to evoke a philosophical tradition which let's call it spatial as opposed to linear. And that spatial tradition puts the human being in a completely different relationship to the place. It takes us off this pyramidal pedestal where we look down on the place and say, well, hey, the only thing that matters is us and we get to do what we want. And that's backfired now. That's why we've got global warming and so on. And it sort of says, no, actually, you're part of the place. You belong in the place. See, this is really simple, but it's no simpler than rational philosophy. It's, it's simply a different approach. And what's fascinating for you is that you actually are part of a place where these other philosophies exist. This is an enormous opportunity. Of course, our universities have turned their backs on this completely. To the extent they teach it, it's in specialized courses. They would never take their courses of philosophy and say, wait a minute, maybe Immanuel Kant is not relevant to the 21st century. Maybe Immanuel Kant is nonsense in the 21st century or has to be seriously rejigged. Maybe, actually, there are some theories of belonging and theories of society and of individualism which are totally different. And they come out of that, that spatial tradition. It's an interesting possibility. And I've talked about this a lot in Canada because of the last book I wrote called The Fair Country, which is, a, which is about Canada, where I actually say the country is far, as, as an interesting place, is far more interesting as an Aboriginal place than it is as a European place. And, people, and then all the time there are these six-foot-three Celts coming up to me and saying, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right, because they realize that the European tradition has run out of steam and has betrayed us, and there's something other, some other possibility.